was. Um, where we are right now is in a, was formerly in a fenced yardway. And probably right around where Skip is standing, there was a hanging tree where I don't know how many prisoners, but at least one or two were hanged out here. Our motto at the Merloy, we are an um, arts and culture center, performing arts center, and an independent movie house showing two films every night and with bringing in world-class performances onto our stage from around the world into Helena, and then we have the art gallery that hopefully you have a few minutes to look at. So our motto is art transforms everything. And I just want to put into your minds right now the place that you are, which was a place of anguish and sorrow and loneliness and fear and is now a place of light and joy and community and great conversation. And you are part of that by being here this morning. So welcome to the Merlin And I didn't mean to interfere, but... Thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chris. Well, still one of our stars is on her way, so... Um, well, if, if you can just set her up when she comes in. Yeah. And are we ready to go? Yeah, you rolling? Are you rolling, Skip? I'm rolling. All right. We lost our clip. I did. Oh. <laughs> well, thank you for uh, showing up for this. Um, this is an important <coughs> part of our confluence this weekend. Because here the focus has been on individual creativity. Here we are, as a, as a world population, every individual feels the, the pressure of these crises that we've been faced with, the COVID crisis, where every one of us is you know, sequestered in our house or our apartment, looking out the window you know, like the dog, Wondering when we can go outside. Um, everybody around the world, except maybe the uncontacted tribes in, in the jungle. But climate change, even the uncontacted tribes are affected by that. You know, these huge global crises that we cannot face as individuals. And so we're trying to illuminate the, the creative response. How do you unlock the healing power of the creative unconscious, which is always an individual thing. So to me, it feels like it's an individual against the world. I'm trying to change our apparently fatal approach to the end of history because of climate change. How am I going to fix that? And the, you know, I come from this long tradition of Methodist ministers on both sides of our family, Chris and I. My, our brother is the sixth generation Methodist minister in our family. And one thing that I think is illuminating to start the discussion is the church, the religion around the world, has always been about trying to grapple with the mystery of being alive in a universe that is full of um, not only danger, but incredible beauty. And, you know, we, we crawl out of the caves, and as animals, we think, man, there's something else going on that, weren't, that wasn't going on for the apes. That with this rising awareness, we realize, oh my gosh, you know, there's a cycle to the, the moon, uh, the moon's life. And wait a minute, why is that attached to women? Why do these cycles happen? So, we, you know, as the cave people started saying, what is going on here? What, what do we, um, how do we grapple with this? And our understanding is that art, which arose maybe between 40 and 60,000 years ago, 
um, was the, the first religious longing, the result of religious longing. Uh, in a time when every day the world is trying to kill you, why spend time taking a torch through a dark cave to, to put something on the cave wall? Um, and that later turned into more conceptualized faith traditions. And that later turned into institutions that support that, uh, that quest. And all through the human development, there has been this sense, we need to, we need to be respectful and appreciative of the great mystery. And it seems to me that the Native Americans were really good at this, seeing, uh, seeing wonder in everything, in all of the creatures, all of the winged people and the rooted people. And everything is connected. And the sun represented the, the life force that keeps us all alive. And we've been doing this water prayer in the morning, where every day you get up and you thank the Great Spirit for another day of life, and you immerse yourself in the water, which is where we came from as sea creatures. And we rise out of the water into the new day. And uh, this, this is what, we don't really have good words for this, but I think of it as the mystical tradition. And Darwin comes along, and the age of reason, and all of a sudden, there's all of this, this furious talk around the, at least in Western culture, about, oh, now we understand that the Earth revolves around the sun. We can do experiments, and we can divide reality up into little bits and uh, describe, which means to flatten everything into a, into a single layer, so everything has equal importance. And it's, it's a really fabulous way of understanding how the world, the parts of the world kind of put, are put together. So you go to the hardware store and there's 10,000 different things and every one of them has a name. If I, if I say to Ryan, you know, go get me a quarter inch bolt that's three and a half inches long, you know, a stove bolt, not a, not a, a hex bolt. Thank you. Did you get your device? From, My waves took me all, all over Robinson Hood's barn and said it was at the corner of 13 uh, and the viewing. But yeah. anyway, finally made it. Um, <laughs> so the, the response in the, in the religious community, in some of the religious community, was oh, you're using science to describe the world by being precise. We can do that with faith. And that's when fundamentalism was born. And I think the cultural understanding is that fundamental means we're going back to the way that religion started. No, fundamentalism is a new thing that, that is a kind of reaction against the clarity of science. And so we get this movement where the, the more conservative end of the church says, well, we can turn the Bible into a kind of scientific treatise. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, the, the world is 4,004 years old, and it was created on, you know, October 27th, something like that. Not realizing that the whole of the tradition is about trying to understand the mystery. This is why the Jews didn't put the vowels in the name Yahweh. It's all breath. You know, science can't, can't name that. And yet the fundamentalists come along and say, yes, we have the answer, this is how it is. And that's been the kind of the conversation across the Western world since, what, 1859. And so the ground of understanding of faith in our country is a, is a reaction against fundamentalism. So there are a lot of atheists and people who are sick of the church and who say that church, that faith causes wars and stuff like that. And John Shelby Spong, who's a 
wonderful um, uh, progressive uh, bishop of the Anglican Church. He, he actually came and spoke at our church a few years ago. He has this fabulous question. Tell me, he, that, that he addresses to atheists, he says, tell me about the God you do not believe in. And incidentally, John Shelby Spong, who's a bishop of the church, is an atheist. And what that means is theism is, is still kind of conforming God to a kind of concept. And so an atheist is a person who says, I refuse to, to try to describe what the mystery is. Because even the, the four letters that make up the word Yahweh, which is breath, is still trying to describe something. And the, the, <laughs> uh, the mystical end of the church has always been about, we cannot, we cannot put words to this. It has to be poetry. When, when God creates the world in six days, it's poetry. I just, I read a beautiful book about how Genesis, it's written by a scientist, how Genesis so beautifully describes the scientific creation of the world. You know, the, how did they know this? That before the planets were born, there was the firmament above and the firmament below. <laughs> how did they know that light was the first thing in creation? And that the, um, that the, the sea was here before the creatures that came. All of this stuff, I think, is proof that the human psyche has a connection to reality that is the same thing as us looking for how to unfold uh, personal creativity. Anyway, that's to line up the fact that in, that our cultural understanding of faith is defined by the people who make the news. It's the, guy that, the guys that fly planes into buildings and the guys that, you know, do suicide bombing. They always make the news. But the mystics who are talking about, you know, isn't this a wonderful, mysterious world? They never get the press. And so we never hear that story. So when we think about religion culturally, it's not the whole spectrum of faith seekers. We get this little part up here of the people who do the horrible things that make the news. And we think, ah, oh, God, who needs religion? So uh, that's sort of the platform on which we uh, address faith questions in the culture. <coughs> And now we have these three wonderful women, all of whom are ordained pastors in, in the mystical tradition. So they, they represent the institutional church. And they have been struggling to, uh, to uplift this very enlivening sense of, uh, of mysticism their whole careers. That part that we never hear about. That's the part that that my family was rooted in, and that you know we still work at every day. And we are very dedicated to, but we're never going to make the news because we don't blow people up. You know. Um, so what I'd like to, us to do is to listen to each of these wonderful women, just talk about the the questions that my <laughs> wise <laughs> sister <laughs> just. Um, encapsulated for me anyway, that, you know, the, the daily news and the, the experiences of life like the brambles in the foreground, how do we clear that out? And the question for you is, what do we look for that can give us hope for the institutional church? Because what we've been saying all weekend is it's the personal um, unfolding of your own secret that is the source of wisdom. And it seems to me that the institutional church is about the only um, institution that has an uplifting effect on culture. 
you know, corporations, governments, hospitals, all of these institutions, universities, um, they're helpful and they're, we all depend on them, but they don't lift up the culture like, like the faith traditions do. And, it, and actually the hospitals and universities, um, uh, welfare programs, the, the, you know, the work week, all of these things were, came out of the traditional church. So, how do we, um, as leaders of the institutional church, what do we look for? We individuals are so frustrated with the way things are going for hope. Those are your questions. And Margaret, maybe you should go first. I'm so glad to be here today with all of you. My name is Margaret Gillipin, and I serve as the lead pastor at St. Paul's United Methodist Church downtown here in Helena. I have so many thoughts swirling through my mind um, based on just the small snippet that I've heard this morning so far. And I just want to share a couple of small points before addressing the question of hope. The first is that if you imagine spirituality and religion as a circle, and it's divided into pie slices, so all of Christianity might be one slice of the pie. Buddhism is a slice of the pie. Islam is a slice of the pie. But the closer you get to the center, all of the pie slices start to look and sound a lot alike, virtually identical. Like every religious tradition has something along the lines of love your neighbor as yourself. They articulate it with different language, but the concept is the same. And the further out you get to the edges, the more rules there are, the more rigidity there is, and there's less access to the fluidity of the mystic. And so when Tim was talking about the struggle between science and fundamentalism, that struggle has been felt very much within, I would say, every religious tradition. Um, so that the mystics who are in tune with what I call the movement of the spirit, but which the Greeks would have called the muses, right? The muse of wisdom, the muse of creativity. Um, you know, however we language that, that ineffable source that um, human beings can miraculously tap into and be led by. Um, however we language that, the people who are located in the middle of that circle are listening for it, they're watching for it, they're open to being a channel of it and to being moved by it. Whereas the folks at the edge are basically saying, don't you pay attention to that, leave it alone. Just do this. Here's the answer. Here's, do these three steps and life will be fine. And pay no attention. And so there's this tension within these institutions that everybody's a member. They're connected. <laughs> they are in radically different places. And one of the challenges is that um, in some circumstances, uh, the rigidity and rule-focused folks have been intentionally undermining the more spirit-led folks. And, and so part of, part of the ineffectiveness of institutions, part of the disappointment that we feel in institutions is a result of that tug of war going on within the institution itself. It's hard to be for it's hard to be prophetic. It's hard to stand up and hold a mirror to the culture and say, look, y'all, this isn't right. And we need to rethink this in a very generative, life-giving way when the rug is being pulled out from underneath your feet at the same time, or somebody's over there busily turning off all the circuit breakers so your microphone doesn't work anymore. So all of this to say, 
Is there hope in institutions? I don't believe there is hope from the institution itself. <laughs> and I say that as someone who has spent 30 years in leadership within the United Methodist Church. Um, and I do think that there is hope, and it's the same place that hope has always been located. And that is in the passion and vision of an individual who then shares, who talks about it, who literally won't shut up about it, mm -hmm. and who enrolls a small group of people around them to say, yep, that sounds right. So let's really do that. And that through their passion, through their energy, through their staying very, very tightly rooted in that vision, they become a movement that draws others to them, that then spreads and has an opportunity to influence the institution from the ground up. So it's an organic transformation of the institution. And institutions resist this. This is why we have things like a Protestant Reformation. This is why there are 15 billion different denominations in the United Methodist, in, in, in the United <laughs> Methodist Church, but in, in all of Christianity. Um, because, you know, we, uh, we're very possessive of our power, of, oh, you know, that desire, that human desire we have to be right. Golly, that is so compelling for some people. Oh, I'm right and you're wrong. Well, what if we're all right? But, uh, so, to me, it's where, where the confluence is of creativity and artistry in conjunction with institutions for hope is, be that passionate person. Be that visionary. Be the person who won't shut up about it. Um, God bless Tim. He's been not <laughs> shutting up about the need for um, physical responses to climate change and has been pushing St. Paul's to make the transition to getting solar panels. And, He's met resistance within the church, and some of it is the old attitude of, you know, it's somebody else's problem. I don't want to have to do it. And, you know, the age-old questions of, well, where will we get the money? And um, I don't have time for that. And rah, 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 all the things that we use to push back against an idea that isn't ours. And Tim has been gathering people around him to be in that conversation. And they've been talking to others in the congregation, others in the community, uh, and gradually drawing together a group of people that sees this is not only a good idea, it's a necessary idea. And it's beginning to have the weight of inevitability about it. So it is moving forward. It is gaining momentum. It might be moving at what looks like glacial pace to Tim, um, but having seen change initiatives like this in the past in local churches, um, I can tell you that it actually is making progress. And I have hope that it really will come to fruition. So. Maybe you've given up hope, but I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and, and this is the kind of thing where any of you, in partnership with people connected to an institution, can make a, a deep and transformative dif di difference. And so, um, you know, if you're already connected to a faith community, 
look for your allies. Look for people who are willing and able to be conversation partners with you and get into dialogue. Start having those conversations about what could we, what could we do around here that would make a difference. And if you're not part of a faith community, look for a faith community in your area that looks like, huh, seems like people I know and trust are connected there. Maybe I'll start talking to those people. <clears throat> because some, some organizations are more ripe for these conversations right. than others. And so part of the whole process of figuring out how to do this work and ha not have it be a waste of time is to be savvy, to look at where the investment of your time, your energy, yourself, is most likely to pay off. So that's my first round. Man, that was beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Integrate um, that reaction 
that anger, that um, desire to strike back, um, fight back, and to find the center. And see, my idea of uh, God is um, has grown from of my Presbyterian childhood <laughs> to what it is now, where if your God doesn't include the whole cosmos, your God is too small for me. And, um, and it's okay for you. I mean, I'm not going to criticize where you're at, but I believe that, um, that creation is one. It's one, and we are all connected. And the movement even of the planets in our solar systems and the way their energy interacts has an impact on us. We know that about the moon. We feel the moon. The outer planets, we're less conscious of it. We think the moon is sub, but I think we're way more conscious of our energies that come from the moon than we are of what's going on um, in a bigger picture. And these are, there are times in human history where we are confronted with that desperate struggle between good and evil. And my tradition, Christianity, came out of that kind of a time, with apocalyptic times, uh, a rising violence within um, trying to, you know, stand against the Roman Empire. And, um, and the church was part of supporting the empire, just like we see today, you know, that, that religion can be used to um, support um, great Putin. evil but and Putin. great good. What? Like Putin? Putin. Yeah. Or our last president, mm -hmm. right? Uh, who, who typically, I mean, and so Nietzsche was right, you know, um, it is a tool, it can be used, and the institutionalization. So what we are experiencing right now is one of those passages of time, and Jesus even talked about that. And, and many of the, the great um, enlightened masters have you know, tried to tell us that things um, are impermanent and they will change. So the hope I have is that this too will pass and we can gain wisdom about from people, mystics and prophets, throughout the history of humanity who have been part of that. And I would say that one of the reasons um, I love working with Tim is that I think that the arts, creativity, is that um, beneficial um, expression of the divine. And, um, and that has been, at times, very heavily promoted by religion, uh, and at times suppressed by religion. And, um, but it is the creator's art, <laughs> really, to me, captures um, the hope. Because the creator is benevolent, and benevolent sometimes looks like death, and life, and cycles, and destruction of institutions. Like, we got to get, get rid of our uh, notions of um, that we can have static or we can keep things from changing. That we, we just might as well just um, let go of that because that is that fear. To me, that is tied to the fear of death. And the fear of death drives so many um, things. And so my practice is very, very connected to the earth and the cycles and planting and regenerating the earth. My vision of the church has more to do, uh, the church that I see moving forward, has more to do with the model of the early Jesus movement before it was patriarchal and hierarchical, which was the oikos, which is um, the whole of life. Uh, a house church was really an economic and social and religious unit. It had all of those components. and. Um, so, and it was very creative. It was very much um, a new, new way of being, and that's why it was contagious and it caught on, and people wanted to be part of the Jesus movement. Um, and I think that that will happen. Mm -hmm. I think that's already bubbling up. 
Um, and that gives me hope. And it's we bubbling all, up all around it. <laughs> it's opening up. And, and so what I would say is that um, we do have a constraint that we are facing. And that is um, that the patriarchy, the hierarchy, includes the domination of Earth. And the domination and exploitation of Earth threatens human life on Earth. And that's my concern right now. So what I've been doing is working as an organizer for a, kind of a startup, fledgling nonprofit in Montana called Montana Interfaith Power and Light. And some of, some of you may have heard of It's a national organization. We're one of their newest affiliates. And um, so I'm organizing um, people of faith and conscious outside of the institutional structure in a collaborative, let's all get together and amplify the voices of people who, like Tim, are willing to really be not only mystical, but prophetic in the face of their institution, um, to call for the church to be a leader um, in, in protecting creation. And um, that's me. So I have those two things. I'm building kind of a, uh, an intentional community around our property, inviting people to be part of that, and also then organizing. So I have my mystical and my prophetic um, going. And I, I think that all of the institutions that we were counting on in the 1980s and 1990s are going through a um, decline. Like, Mm -hmm. Many of them are on life support. I see signs of many things needing hospice. <laughs> and, and that care of transitioning and letting go of what this is and being open for something we, we don't um, clearly see, we only see in the mirror dimly, then we will see face to face. But getting over that fear and being um, excited about being not no longer bound by our physical bodies, but being spirit, which the universe has way more spirit and energy than it has matter, and um, we get so attached to matter. So that's that's where I find hope. What's your name? Oh, so, my name. Does that matter? It's Robin. Robin yes, Morrison. <laughs> Thank you. I realize that I have failed to do the one thing that I was sent up here to do, which is introduce our guests. <laughs> ich bin ausgereicht. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's but, only one way to pronounce that. <laughs> but because Wally has control of the fourth dimension and can, can morph time, Maybe you can cut out this part and, and put it at the beginning. Yeah. So it seems like I'm thank you for thank you for coming today. <laughs> <laughs> so you can make it seem like I'm more confident than I actually am. So I will start back at the beginning. It's only 9:05 here. This is Reverend uh, Margaret Gilligan, who's my uh, lead pastor of my church, and she also pastors another uh, Methodist church. It's, it's uh, St. Paul's United Methodist. Mm -hmm. There's another one across town called Covenant that she's also uh, pastoring, what do you say, co-pastoring? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I have a great deal of respect for Margaret. She's a great preacher. Um, and I hope that we can use her as a resource in our community. She's actually a, a participant in the, in the confluence, but she's been way too busy to come to anything. So. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you for, for being with us. And Robin Morrison, she told you everything you need to know about her. Um, I've been in, attached to the Interfaith Power and Light organization that she's talking about. And when we, we created a Montana version of that, uh, Robin headed up that. And so finally, it seems like there's this burst of energy that is newly available to us big people in Montana. And this is Judith Stone, who is an ordained minister. Um, I have some remarkable uh, synchronistic connections with Judith. 
I think we found four now. One of which is she went to a seminary at PSR with our brother back in the 70s. And it turns out that she's also a really good friend of John Jackson. And, uh, and she turns out to be the pastor of a, a guy that Chris and I knew before we were born. He was, uh, he's a member of a family that my father's church, that was in my father's church when we were born. And he has been a lifelong friend, and Judith got to be his pastor when he was an old man. And anyway, this is the way the world works. Our brother says, uh, coincidence is God's way of staying anonymous. Can you repeat so, that, Tim? Anyway, Can you hear it? That? Coincidence is God's way of staying anonymous. Ah. <laughs> so Judith is, has been a pastor in California. She retired how long ago? Seven years. And I'm really happy to have her here. She and I have been having these great conversations, and Skip and I are going to interview her sometime in the short future for his uh, web channel. So, Judith. Okay, so you. I'm going to get this, and I'm going to start out by saying, first of all, I am so honored to be able to speak with the two of you. You have just inspired me so much. I make me feel so happy. And I um, never had that experience before, just being on a panel with uh, majority women. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, and my, because I haven't, I have really taken myself out of the public arena, um, have not, have refused to do a sermon for six years. And so this is like more like a sermon. So I apologize in advance. Too much suppression of how I, so it's kind of the only way that uh, this could form itself. Uh, the, the question Tim asked, and the question Tim asked me is, uh, what do you think about the state of the church right now? And so I began with uh, asking myself, well, if I'm going to talk about what's the state of Christianity right now, I want to begin with the question of, um, what I think about, what, what I think is the uh, meaning of or the, the purpose of religion. What's it all about for me? And, um, and so uh, the first thing I thought of was uh, Jane Fonda was asked why she became a Christian. And she said because she heard a reverence humming inside of her. She heard a reverence humming inside of her, and Christianity spoke to that uh, reverence. So one of the purposes, I think, of religion is to help us hear that reverence that's humming inside of us. To help us hold an astonishing conversation with mystery and all the mysteries that are at the heart of life to help us form beautiful questions. Uh, David White, a poet that I just really love so much, I went to a weekend with him and the whole thing was about the importance of forming beautiful questions. And I think that uh, that's something that all of the religious traditions uh, participate in. To help us notice and be seized by beauty and the possibility that being alive offers. To help us uh, live gratitude. To help us to live in relationship with uh, all of the realms of life, the seen and the unseen, the here and now, the past, the future, all the dimensions of life. To help us live in gratitude for that. And yes, uh, to urge us and to uh, be a part of satisfying the urge in us to have an astonishing uh, conversation, not with just with mystery, but with the great mystery. 
In Christianity, we name that mystery love. And we proclaim that love is the foundational reality. It's the breath of life. It's the glue that holds everything together. It's the heartbeat, the pulse of life. So what might be some of the beautiful questions we would bring to Christianity? If the foundational reality is love, then why do we look around us and not see, see so many other forces operational being, uh, in the world around us? Why is love everywhere being violated? Why is there so much inequality and injustice if love is the foundational reality? If love requires us to be interconnected one with another, and to me that's another way of talking about love. Then why is there so much war? Hunger, injustice, racism, sexism, homophobia, environmental degradation, indifference, colonialism. Christianity talks about this as sin. Hunger. Now there's a sin for you. Environmental degradation. Now, there's a sin for you. Disregard of the neighbor. Well, now there's a sin for you. Not seeing yourself as worthy of love, as the radiance of the divine, as uh, uh, someone with great possibilities. Now, there's a sin for you. Sin talks about systemic and personal realities that violate love, that violate our fundamental and foundational interconnectedness one with the other. And when love is violated, we are all affected, personally, uh, uh, in the world around us, we're all in, affected in ways that are large and small. I wrote this out because I tend to go on and on and on. <laughs> um, another beautiful question might be, Uh, I'm gonna, I have one more. If uh, love is a foundational reality, then why can't even religious people talk together across religious lines? I mean, that's especially horrible, isn't it? Because we're violating who we are, what we are to be in the world uh, foundationally. We're our own charters. But another beautiful question might be, why is there so much love in the world? Why is there so much forgiveness in the world? Why do people everywhere help and support each other, come to each other's aid, pray for each other? Why do animals take care of their young? Why is there so much beauty, which I think is a reflection of love, in the stuff, in the matter of creation? So I feel that spirit and matter, are, uh, and, or soul and matter, are one uh, unity. How can I be an ally of that love that is also everywhere present in creation? Why do so many people live beyond ego? How can I be a part of that? 
Christians uh, look to Jesus Christ to help us with that project of being a person who lived beyond ego, a person for others, and in flesh that. Uh, and so because of that, it's a life uh, worth looking at. I think for anybody, and, and I try to look at the life of uh, the Buddha and the life uh, and the people at the heart of all the other religious traditions because I feel like they have something to say to me. So many beautiful lives. Jesus Christ for Christians elaborates what love is, um, but love is the found, uh, it, it's not the only place that love is, it, is elaborated in the world. Jesus Christ, that Christ is not a last name. <laughs> it connects Jesus to that fundamental power of love and living beyond ego, uh, living in profound connection to the whole. And so the Christ force uh, uh, for Christians is so radiant uh, within Jesus. But love is not coterminous with Jesus. The universe is 13.7 billion years of old. If love uh, is the foundational power of the universe, it was here long before uh, Jesus Christ. For me, it's embedded in the nature of the created order. Perhaps the Big Bang is a reflection of it. Einstein was a big fan of love. The honeybee and the pollination process tell us of all the ways that all the orders of creation are infected with love. Its magnetism is everywhere. Sally McFaig, a modern female theologian, yay, <laughs> calls the world, the cosmos, the body of God. The first incarnation of love is into materiality, the materiality of the created world, gases, cells, atoms, stars, Cats. <laughs> We're radiant with love. We're radiant with God. We're radiant with possibility. And how can it be otherwise? And so a beautiful question is, why does it get blocked in us? And how is it blocked in us? And that is a question that can open each and every one of us. I wanted to ask some questions there. In a wonderful book, uh, The Universal Christ by Richard Rohr, um, who talks about how it gets uh, blocked in Christianity. And he says, we cannot overestimate the damage that was done to the gospel message when the Eastern Greek and Western Latin churches split, beginning their mutual excommunication, each of the other. We have not none, known one wholly undivided church for over a thousand years. Years. So when you were talking about oneness and that great singularity, Christians first must ask our, ourselves how that is blocked in us and, and not try to dodge that question, but take it on uh, firmly. And then Thor says, but you and I can reopen that ancient door of faith and love and that, that is a key to a proper understanding of a word that many of us have often used too glibly, and that word is Christ. What if Christ is a name for the transcendent within everything in the universe? What if Christ is a word for the transcendent within everything, every blade of grass, every atom within us? What if that's the meaning of the word Christ. What if Christ 
is a name for the immense spaciousness in all of love. What if Christ refers to an infinite horizon that pulls us from within and pulls us forward? What if Christ is another name for everything in its fullness? And then he says he believes that's what the big tradition and Margaret, what you were talking about, you know, we get close to that center. I, I love that image. It's just uh, so beautiful. What if we listen deeply to the voice of creation? What would we hear? What if we listen to ourselves? as an amalgam of all of the orders of creation. What if we saw ourselves, at the, what I tried to uh, find as I was leaving, I don't know where I put it this morning, but a book by Rob Bell, where he talks about the human being as a reflection or holding within it an oyster shell, the different, the, the distant stars, uh, the components of mushrooms that that is all of what is a part of the form, uh, formation of who we are. And what if we regarded ourselves and, and listened to ourselves that way, that would, which would help us uh, listen to all of the orders of creation that are around us? What if we were able to encounter, uh, uh, in stark truth, our own violations of love? What if we were able to admit when we become the handmaiden of injustice? What if we're able to admit when we're uh, racist, homophobic, uh, in full force, and not pull back from that? And I would say that, you know, for me, as a Christian, I feel I can do that because uh, I have heard the good news that where sin doth abound, grace doth more abound. In Christianity, we usually close with a prayer or with a song. And so I was thinking of the prayer of Jesus in the Gospel of God, uh, John, where he says that they might all be one. The two-leggeds, the four-leggeds the winged ones, the distant stars, the microbial orders of creation, that they might all be one, or a song. And when I thought about the song, I thought, uh, I am the light of the world, by the Strathbees, or my conference. I am the light of the world, or I am the love force of the world. You who follow in love can claim the mystery of what you were meant to do and be, to bring hope to every task you do, to dance at a baby's new birth, to make music in an old person's heart, to sing the colors of the earth. Okay, so where's the hope for me? And you know, what's for me, what was the state of the church? And when I retired from the ministry, and the reason I did not uh, give sermons is because I felt that my entire life was a failure because I devoted it to the church. And uh, I felt a deep sense of hopelessness and meaninglessness in my own life because I had made that decision. But what began to happen over, like, probably took three years before it started, happen, started to happen, but I began to notice all the gifts that the church had given an ordinary uh, person like me. I don't feel like I gave much to the church, but I feel like the church gave uh, so much to me uh, and if it can do that, that for me, that's where the hope is. 
And for the uh, Jungians here, the uh, Jungian dream, when uh, Jung sees the uh, turd uh, drop on the church and break it open and break it apart, and then he feels that God insisted that he dream that dream, um, I want to assure you that that force is still in the church. That God that dropped that big turd that, that, uh, on the church in Yu's dream is still embedded and working within the church as everywhere in creation and even then starting with those microbial orders that's been there for a long time. That's where the hope is for me. tell you how honored I feel to be sitting up here with you guys. <laughs> um, this is such a blessing to hear this kind of wisdom. And as I said before, we never get to hear this stuff. And of course, if, if I go to church on Sunday and listen to Margaret, I get to hear a little bit of it. And um, isn't it wonderful that somehow the, the organizers were able to bring you guys together and to, to give us an opportunity to hear this stuff. Because it's so easy to, to be um, distracted by the noise and the brambles. And you know, when it appears every day in the paper, you just get bludgeoned over the head every day. This is what religion is about. You know, it's and this beautiful, quiet voice that that um, <clears throat> you said the beauty is is a manifestation of love. And incidentally, think about your questions because that's that's what we're going to go to next. Mm -hmm. As an artist, I am uh, drunk with beauty, mm -hmm. and every day. I go out and I look at the sky and I'm blown over, especially the Montana sky. Fabulous. I'm blown over with the beauty in the sky. It's like the best aesthetic experience ever. And to me that is my prayer, is having this conversation with the universe. And why is it? As you, as you brought up, why is it that we invent this telescope that looks out way out into the distant galaxies? In fact, last weekend I was with a guy who, who was part of that project, the, the deep field project for the, um, the Hubble telescope. I was one of the first human beings that got to see the, the little grainy picture of the farthest galaxy ever that we've seen. And, um, so, okay, we, we construct this telescope, we look out into the far reaches of the universe, and it is gorgeous. And to me, that's, that's a proof of what you're talking about, that love is everywhere. If I, as a, as a human being, was to put together a, a universe, I would do it like a concentration camp. Let's get it done. Let's feed the people, you know, give them some gruel. Put, put the beds in five uh, um, layers, you know, give everybody striped pajamas, let's just get it done. That's kind of the, you know, the Western uh, patriarchal sort of uh, very masculine, action-oriented thing. But the, the universe is full of beauty. What's the purpose of that? And, you know, why does the flower have to be so beautiful? Why are the birds... Songs always, they're always beautiful. Why when you look at an at a electron microscopic vision of a, of a, you know, the, the hair on the leg of a pig, why is it so beautiful? <laughs> right? Yeah. Right. yeah. Right. Or as Chris says, when in the, in the fall, you know, all these trees turn into beautiful colors. They're, you know, the leaves are dying. Why don't they just turn brown and smell bad like everything else? <laughs> so, um, thank you so much for, 
for this illumination. So I want to open it up for questions. Deb. Well, I'm sitting here. This was wonderful. And uh, sitting here feeling like you've helped me constellate why I feel hopeful. And, and by the way, I sh should say, I'm sitting here as someone raised in northern Maine as a Baptist who perceived that as just a huge no and wanted to find out what I could say yes to, found myself over decades of uh, becoming a Buddhist, a Vajrayana Buddhist, and uh, very magically now having much more of an appreciation for Christianity because of love at the heart of it. And so what gives me hope, though, is there seems to be this hopefully approaching critical mass of people who, no matter what faith tradition, if any, they're starting from, that they're changing their fundamental relationship to their beliefs. And what I, what I mean by that is, on the one hand, you could look at all these faith traditions as paths up a mountain, and at the top of the mountain, there's this table, and everybody's got their beliefs laid out on the table, and it's kind of, oh yeah, we have this in common, and that in common, and not that in common, we won't talk about those. And it, that kind of is where a lot of the traditional interfaith discussions have, have been, looking for what could be common ground. But I think what's changing is that more and more of us are finding that actually we're walking different paths up to the, the top of the mountain. But we get to a cliff, and at that cliff at the top, we all just have to let go of our beliefs and leap as one into the great mystery. And as more and more people kind of come to that experience, because it's a very personal experience. First of all, you start being joyful about anybody who can keep their feet on any path to get them up to the top of the mountain. Whatever works for you, boy, I celebrate. Yeah. And let's all get up there and let's leap together, because we are one after all in that great mystery. We just find it hard to experience. And it just seems to me we're getting closer to something like that, where our, we're willing to let our beliefs fall away for the wonderful aids to getting up the mountain they were, but they don't constrain us at a certain point, and that we can just fly. So anyway, thank you. I feel very hopeful. <laughs> well said. Yeah, thanks, Yeah. Um, I want to tie, tie, my thoughts go back to what we've been talking about in the confluence, and one of those things is the aesthetic it. And the aesthetic it is what we as individuals experience as the mystery. You know, why do we like a certain um, piece of art or what, you know, that takes us to the place in us which touches the mystery. And um, I think that uh, all religions, uh, people of all religious faiths have this experience. Um, I, I, my tradition is a Christian tradition. And um, I think that a role that that institution can play has to do with helping people to get in touch with the experience of their aesthetic it. And uh, most religions, institutional religious are, 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 have, have sound associated with their practice somehow. And for me, the, the, the Christian music is extremely powerful. <laughs> and it is uh, an opportunity for an experience of the individual aesthetic it. And I think that my, my hope lies in the, the church being able to bring the, its members to an experience, to an individual experience of the aesthetic it, because that's what's going to unite us. That's the shared mystery. And uh, I have a, a, a slight bias against um, the way the church has brought in sort of it, uh, music that is not um, What's what? Um, what's the word that takes you above? You know the transcendent. 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 
because it's the transcendent experience that unites us. So, thank you very all very much for if if I if, if I might piggyback on this, um, the idea of um, experience as being pivotal, I think, is very timely. Um, one of the things that the COVID pandemic has done is um, accelerate the process of institutional decline for churches. Um, the decline of um, church participation during COVID was 64%. Um, the average church is uh, today has 50% of the participation that it had pre-COVID, and that's across the board. And and so, you know, one of the things that um, leaders are looking at is, all right, so what is there to do now? What is there to be now post-COVID? And one of those things is to be very focused on being a community, building community. And another is to be very intentional about no longer wasting time and talking about God, but instead providing spiritual experiences. Thank you. I would like to um, speak for another path that I had the great blessing as a 17 year old at the University of Texas to have a professor of Eastern philosophy named Raja Rao and I learned from him that what is the pearl of that path and I've and I've and other paths that I've followed too that that nugget that pearl is that truth beauty love and consciousness are all one and that all of life including all of the animals and plants are um, one and i loved your last metaphor judy judith uh, that is no judy right judith, judith yeah. okay there's another judy um, that metaphor of, you know, that, and I hope that Young is listening. <laughs> that great herd that fell on, who had, was from, like Tim, his family was from generations of ministers in the Christian church. And um, that the, it is fertilizing the development and evolution of Christianity through all of these little, uh, uh, sorry, the word is escaping me right now, but the uh, microbes of the fertilized that is just like that, which is in that we need to use to save our planet by uh, protecting the development of those microbes in the earth. Thank you so much. I am doing a new thing that oh. springs forth. to 
live out the life that is in the direction of it. Uh, but the psychological challenge, and I wonder if the um, church uh, will ever make friends with psychology, yeah. with helping how this is going to happen for the human being. I think, I think we very much already are. Mm -hmm. And where you're going to find that is in the quote unquote mainline uh, Protestant tradition um, <coughs> and in um, Catholics like Father Richard Rohr. Mm -hmm. um, so, but even within, for instance, the United Methodist Church, um, we're in the process of you know, calving off our extreme conservatives into a new group. And who's going to be remaining in the United Methodist Church is going to be um, folks who are in conversation with psychology. And, you know, when you talk about Maslow, one of the things that I'm keenly aware of was that during COVID, everyone, everyone went down at least two levels on Maslow's hierarchy in terms of where was our attention focused. It was focused on security. It was focused on need for community and shelter and food and nobody had time or energy or will to look at self-actualization when you're convinced that the sky is falling and everybody's gonna die. So now, you know, part of the task of, I would say, faith communities who are conversant with psychology is to do the work of both reassuring people, like, okay, you know, let's make sure that those foundational levels are met, and how do we reintegrate all the way up? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's, it's, 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 a, it's a connecting, it's an integration task before us now. That's a, I, that, that, uh, I can see that the organization, organization of the church can, can provide that, that awareness, that structure, that understanding. I think one of the things that happened um, with COVID is uh, the being thrown back upon ourselves as individuals. And that um, at the same time, there's been a quickening of the understanding of the contribution of Carl Jung for going within and how much the uh, unconscious is running the show. Yes. Um, no. And so to how, how we grapple with that and understand ourselves uh, with that. So the ideals are, are um, readily available from the church. Um, the process of how do we do it is one that I'm glad to hear that there's attention to it. Um, as years in Methodist Church myself, I know a little bit of what you're talking about. You know, and actually, it's uh, through the church, the Episcopal Church, that I learned about Carl Jung. Mm -hmm. But then the organization of the church, um, I, I did not see the structure there, or the concern there, for what those people had to offer. Mm -hmm. I hope it will be more so. Well, I would even, I have, I really struggled and uh, fought with the clericalism, you know, the idea that within religious traditions there are people sort of set apart. And the problem with that is that it has tended throughout history to be set on a higher pedestal, like set in a position with more power and more influence. Um, but that wasn't really the spirit of the early movements in any of the traditions, really, you know. Um, and there, I, I believe, having really, I mean, I I'm really tuned into that authoritarianism, hierarchy, patriarchy, and that it is that, you know, um, sign of the line that strikes through the heart of every human being. And the part of us that is afraid of our own death um, and our own mortality um, is driving us to have more power. And so there's a part of Abraham Maslow's self-actualization that's a positive development in human nature, but it is also produced 
The other flip side, or the shadow of that, is a hyper-individualistic culture. So self-actualization in the, in, as a separate self versus um, actualization as part of a unified cosmos. Um, and institutions are inherently um, subject to that collective, that I said, that archetype of the scapegoat. Um, they're, that energy produced, it, it has, a, has a tendency to feed um, that mechanism where you know, we have the purity of our group by excluding ourselves and making um, yeah. others out of, and that's the role of the scapegoat has been there mm -hmm. since you know, um, ancient times. Yeah. Institutions are organized for self-preservation. And so when it is against the institution's best interests, self-interest, to, uh, you know, incorporate things like psychological care for its members or to allow a different wisdom tradition to influence how it organizes itself, the institution rejects it. So, you know, for you to say, look, I'm not seeing this influenced in the structure of the institution itself, yeah, you're right, you don't, um, <laughs> because the institution is busy preserving its power. Yeah, it's it's a, institutions. Only institutions. They're just, a, just as afraid of their death as human, human beings because they're a collective energy of human beings. And the Bible <laughs> talks about them as the uh, principalities and the powers yeah. that are in operation. So long has it been. Yeah. yeah. One thing our father uh, used to say about this is the church is the only institution membership to which is dependent on one per one's unworthiness to belong. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that all the leaders are also unworthy of being in the church because, mm -hmm. because it's not about worthiness. It's about, it's about surrender. And so how do you, as a, as a leader of the church, um, how do you inhabit that position of great power and authority and also be this humble person who is unworthy to be even a member of this community. It's, it's one of those paradoxes that I think is so rich because both sides of that are true. And you have to have some kind of an organization in order to keep all the cats together in one place, but, but you also have to inhabit your humble homeless. So Bob, did you have a question? Well, I, I completely disagreed. I, with your statement that we had lost two levels of Maslow's five levels of development, um, this is, I, my experience with my patients, I am a psychologist. My experience with my patients was that several, many of them, took the opportunity to address much more deeply their life and their own spiritual development. And in some cases, really prospered. In others, <clears throat> It was a time out from life that afforded them an opportunity to assess what was missing or what they wanted in a, in a way that Tim was talking about, away from the bombardment of, of life, you know, the bump and the grind, um, the job. And so I, <clears throat> my experience was different. Um, and that's why I disagree. Thank you. Well, what I'm, yeah, what I'm hearing is, is actually an agreement between these two things. Because I think you're right that we were, we were reduced to this kind of you know, worry about our survival. And how are we going to get groceries and know that we're safe and that kind of thing? And, and being bumped down, I think, 
what you're saying made a lot of people think about what, you know, gra grapple with the self-examined life. So, yes, I'm in danger, and, and yes, I'm worried about food and, and those lower levels. And I think there are some people who sort of get reduced to that and stop there. And the, the people you're talking about get reduced to that and say, well, wait a minute, my life is richer than that. So maybe I don't want to go back to this job that I hate. You know, I, maybe I can survive, I realize I can survive without that, without working for the man. And so, you know, I'm going to start my own business or I'm going to write a book. But Tim, I'm, I'm also talking about the, not the, not the, the nuts and bolts of survival. I'm, I'm talking about the spiritual quest within and and taking the, the the intensity off in COVID, I, I think of it as COVID shadow. That the, the shadow to COVID was we were left in a kind of monastic situation that we didn't want or or particularly like being separated from each other as as gruesome as that was. But my experience was there were several of my patients, just personally, that, that took that opportunity to hone and develop and read and meditate and reflect spiritually on their own, on their own development, where they wanted to go, what was missing, and how they could express themselves more meaningfully in life. I, I, that was my experience, but I, um, I wasn't one of those people trying to survive in a frontline job. My, I, I had um, the resources and the ability to really do that, and um, so we, it really did, if you had that privilege of being able to, um, to care for yourself and do that reflective, that was one of the when you think of how many millions of people were in a survival mode. And I'm just, I, 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 I agree yeah. that, that my perspective is skewed. And, and I got to own that, that um, I'm not, my practice is not at the, at, the, at the level of food, clothing, shelter, and the step up yeah. safety. Yeah. So. Yeah, and you know, and I will, I will own that I was absolutely speaking at a very large generalization because I also know people who were able to use that enforced monastic time for great spiritual growth and development. And I live across the street from low-income housing. I now house a young person who had a mental breakdown at the same time that COVID began and was, it, it, I spent a great deal of time with people who were literally on the edge. And, um, and, and part of my assessment of what happened to us politically and culturally as a nation was the development of stages with Maslow. Like, like that's, that's the little bit of comfort I have for myself with looking at our political circumstances, like, okay, we devolved at what level we're functioning. We've just got to get through this so that we can grow ourselves back up again, systemically. But uh, that, that's, that's the most positive explanation I have for the political work realities these days. And I think that's very nicely said. That how do we grow ourselves back up systemically? And I, and to that end, uh, that's what's brought us together in confluence. I, I wonder if part of the isn't what I hear implicitly, I think, and you brought in, you, you even used the word a few times. Can you speak up a little bit? I'll try. <laughs> um, and that is, you know, we talk, of, we're talking very well, I think, about uh, love and sort of this uh, coming into oneness. That, were, that is really important. And, you know, Tim, you asked several times, you know, 
what is this about? Or, you know, how do we come to understand the antithesis of that? What is the antithesis of that? And I think from a, a, a spiritual and a psychological perspective, in a very broad way, this is a broad word that actually manifold and highly nuanced, it's fear. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think the question, you know, this is, I think, what's occupied me so much over the, I also am a psychotherapist, and a lay and trusted Dharma teacher in the Soto Zen tradition, um, is how do we walk into the fear of our neighbor yes. rather than fall into despair, disappointment, and maybe hectoring? Hectoring retrenches fear. Yes. It does not um, uh, uh, begin to mitigate it. And this is a reality that I think you know that many of us probably, um, maybe in some ways, have actualized beyond some of that we've been able to integrate our fear in some way, where we could surrender. How do we recognize our brother who um, for example, this is one way of thinking about it, of, uh, who are raised in very stringent, strict, behaviorally oriented households and um, did what um, Anna Freud called identifying with the aggressor. This is the way it is. And by God, what I'm going to do is conform and when we're talking about art and all of its manifest way, like this moment right now, how do we begin to move into that space, our own space, mm -hmm. that fear that we can experience and probably did experience at some time, maybe even experiencing and witnessing the conformity that's implicit in our talk right now. How do we begin to, and we're not identifying with the aggressor. If anything, we're identifying with the victim. So how do we sort of move into inclusiveness of the recognition that this fear is implicit in every person's life? The need for belonging, which can be love or it can be fear. How do we begin to cross that bridge and begin to integrate that from the inside out where we're not trying to cure somebody else's fear? But this recognition that skips that of we're all in this suit together. Well, it goes back to my um, belief that the creativity represented in the arts community, which was really foundational of the the rising of religious traditions also. That it is that um, that brings the beauty and um, that experience of the transcendent. Um, and that art has been music, drama, theater, even landscaping, you know, art in all of, and this uh, the rising of the sun, all of that um, is, is grounded in the, the the love, the connection, the oneness, um, and um, to the the voice of the arts. In, and one of the things that we're dealing with right, right now is the domination of our media, um, which is actually pushing artists out and and using you know my artificial intelligence even in in what movies and TV and um, gets pushed out there. So um, really organizing uh, that kind of energy, because art is, can, um, music can touch, um, art and music and those things, and theater can touch um, and change mindsets, the conversations and data and news won't. And we need both the arrows and the logos. Yeah. And of course, you know, the response is, um, so where are all these people, Chris, 
how how full is the Myrna Loy these days? And people that I'm talking about aren't going to accept that premise. They they don't care about art. They loathe it. They view it as as soft and silly and superfluous because they have not crossed that bridge. So how do we again? How do we begin to recognize that reality without necessarily despairing? I, I really felt a great kinship with you when you talked about the sense of failure. I've had that many, many times in my life as well. And I think it, I think at times about Christ. His life was a failure too. Mm -hmm. And there's beauty in failure. There is beauty in failure. And, um, and I think that's one of the things that really moves people toward Christianity. And, and I was raised as a Christian. I, I still retain the exact same profound connection to the Spirit of Christ that I had when I was 13 or 14 and really found my way into the Gospels. And that this is, this is beyond lovely. And it's, it's that peace that many Christians, as I view it at any rate, and I would love to have a dialogue with Christians who feel this way, is that they, they're afraid. They don't have this surrender. So one of the things that I will wear of is that um, The Christian tradition often posits love and fear as a duality. They're opposites. Um, perfect love casts out fear. And I'm mindful, I've read and listened to a lot of Richard Rohr, and I really, um, really very much appreciate his perspective that that mystical, much more actualized and mature uh, sensibility is non-dualistic. And so I wonder if part of the bridge that there is for us to build as people who see the organizing principle of life being love is how do we lovingly reach out to those who are drowning in fear rather than rejecting them and making them wrong? And how do we instead have love include fear? Mm -hmm. And I have no idea what the answer is, but I think it's a question worth really looking at. I was very impressed. I was very impressed last night in our uh, after the play conversation about the power of understanding and I don't know that this is an answer per se but boy I, I really felt deeply uh, enhanced with the conversation about Desmond Tutu and listening and understanding rather than judging and the power of just listening and the healing that took place in South Africa in the process of listening and attempting to understand listening genuinely honestly not patronizingly and that to me was the dessert <laughs> after the play was like, wow. But I wanted to say one thing about that because uh, uh, that listening wasn't, uh, the people agreed not to just say anything. They, could, they had to tell the truth. And the families that they heard could say whether they felt like they really heard the truth or not. So they didn't just tell their story, they told the truth of the damage they felt that they had inflicted 
And that, um, and love to me is great enough to incorporate that, uh, that truth telling. And that's the truth will set you free. But for first, it hurts a lot. You know, and, and I don't feel like the church has stepped up yet and told the truth about its complicity. And I feel like it has, needs to be done in all quarters. Church psychology institutions uh, to try to uh, uh, be fearless about uh, trying to look at the damage we do because well, there's uh, you know, because of the, this foundational uh, reality of love, and then we can become new. We can, when we become fearless, then we can become new. And I'm not there yet. I'm working on it. We've got time for maybe two more questions. And we should wrap up. Skip. Well, I just want to observe that everybody is talking about looking for an answer. Mm. And um, a favorite quote of mine uh, from Gertrude Stein is, there ain't no answer. There never has been any, any answer. There ain't going to be no answer. That's the answer. And so whenever I start, whenever I hear people start talking about institution, as soon as they start talking about lawyers and accountants, <laughs> and I'm, I am one and sort of the other, by profession, um, I think my sensitivity is to run the other way. And Colleen and I were having a discussion about this this morning, and you know, we I made the point to her that, you know, I don't want any part of saving any religious organization. I don't want any part of saving somebody else's belief. Uh, one of the things that Carl Jung said at the end of his life, he was interviewed and he was asked, like Tim, he was the son of six generations of pastors. Uh, he was asked, do you believe in God? And he said, very difficult to answer but I have no need to believe, I know. And when I saw that, my response, my numinous response to that was, I too know, now what is it that I know? And I think we have to lead people to the place where they can know themselves because this question that comes up all the time in fundamentalism is especially is do you believe do you believe and that mean what what they mean when they say that is do you believe in my way of doing this and it seems to me that the human answer going forward has got to be, I don't believe. I'm not going to do something because I have to believe what somebody else has developed over thousands of years because all that has proven horribly wrong in the 20th century. We killed 280 million human beings in the 20th century in wars, and we're doing it again in this century. And so if all those beliefs had been right and helpful in that century, and now we wouldn't have any problems today, but we do have problems. And so we each, Young was emphatic in uh, Man and His Symbols, which is the only book that he wanted, written, wanted to write for the layman. 
he was emphatic that we all have to examine ourselves and find what we know that can help us. And he said in the next paragraph, I know what the Buddhists would say. They would say that if everybody only follows the Eightfold Path, then everything will be hunky-dory. And I, I know... Would not say that. Pardon? Not say that. Not say that. No, he would not say that. Well, no. He was wrong about that. <laughs> well, he may have been wrong about that, but that's the way he said it in his right. book. Okay? Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not saying he was right, because there ain't no answer. Right. And, but he, and he caused us to... Pardon? That would be the Zen response. There is no question and there is no answer. It, it just is. As right. It is. And, and so, um, anyway, that's my question, point, whatever. Um, I, I'd like to um, thank you for putting this group together. Um, and in particular, because we have these three examples. Um, that are all very different in how you've, uh, all three of you have seriously engaged the church. And all three of you have come up with different ways of being with the church and, and finding your role with your religion. And um, that's one of the wonderful things about this particular panel, I think. Um, and so I admire you for staying in it and taking it on and uh, doing what you can in the organization of it. And you've got more than one parish to deal with. And, you know, and then how you take it to the, the land and you activate it, um, that it's not going to work there. But you know, if I'm going to do it, it's got to be with my hands and here. And, and then you're, you're thinking about it. You know, you're, you're stepping away and, and preaching and thinking about it. And, uh, just your your uh, reflection after the play last night about so if Carl Jung had this experience uh, what did he do with it you know we never heard him say anything about it um, so that I think is it's just wonderful to see these different and there are four of us here who have seriously engaged the church and yeah. on the panel others. Uh, who have to and uh, sustain wounds. Um, I had a, an experience last night where my oldest child called me and on my phone it comes up as no caller ID, which is so strange, but <laughs> she Recently, uh, she's bipolar and she doesn't believe I'm her biological mother. Mm -hmm. And I, when I speak to her now in this very removed, very artificial way, I try to tell her I love her when I can't connect and I can't convince her that I'm her biological mother. Mm -hmm. And. I want to express a worry for the young people who are so intelligent and so full of potential in what they're inheriting. Um, and this incredible exhibit um, yes. in the theater. Yes. I didn't get all the way through, but I was in the seven pieces and I was ready to just weep. And I. I just want to express a uh, not only concern for the young people, but um, a trust in their intelligence because they're so resilient and open and so scared. And as we've been speaking, we're all frightened. But uh, it did cross my mind at one point in the pandemic that if I did catch COVID and if I did die, I wanted to have things in alignment for my three children. So I, I created a will, which I'd never thought about doing before. And I, I thought to myself, okay, well, if I go, that's not the worst thing in the world. Um, I've had a really good life so far, been very lucky. 
And I just wanted to leave them a legacy of having things lined up for them. And really all I just want to say is that I, I try to listen to the young people even more so now because of what they're going through and how smart they are. And um, not be threatened by their superior knowledge of technology. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go ahead, and then we should oh. probably call it quits. Okay, Please. thank you. Um, well, I had a couple things to share. Um, and the, the first one I just wanted uh, was very similar in some ways to what you were saying, Jessica. And I'm going to say, because we were talking some about what happened during the pandemic and, and still ongoing. And I was going to say, as a, as a psychotherapist of many decades, I. Um, have never had such an influx of calls from families for for counseling continuously, like every week, every more and more, with children that were experiencing anxiety and panic, and the age has gotten down to like 12 years old or less. Yes. And of course, I'm just practicing part time now, and there weren't even enough resources. I tried to call these families back but there were never enough resources to refer them. And um, so, but what I, what I heard when I talked to some of them was so much a crisis of belonging. And that's being talked about today. And so I thought this setting that we're in, just what you were saying, Jessica, that this art is so hopeful for, the chil for children, young people, to create the sense of belonging to themselves again, so they can somehow find a way to belong to the world. And um, the other thing was, um, along with this, I was going to say I was so excited when I heard what, and, and especially getting to be here, what the panel was going to be, because I, I did grow up as a Presbyterian my first 18 years. So I had a lot of exposure to the church, and the, the middle, after that, I, I won't address anything about, but I was taken back into the church when my daughter married a Presbyterian pastor. So, <laughs> so I've, and he's very innovative, but I've watched him struggle. So I was thinking, I was taking some notes, you know, what can I hear um, that, that could be, you know, offered back to him also as an encouragement. And um, yet I wanted to just remark that one of the things he's come to is how to just use these existing campuses that you know, take up, they're, they're there on the earth and they're in the center of the community and they're largely empty. So he has started to invite one of the things being a children's nonprofit theater into the campus. And so the community comes in and there's no sense of joining church or anything, nothing like that, but it's a center where there's a lot of energy of love and hope in that place. And so just our, you know, I feel a deep obligation now as an older person to help children and help young people and, and to support that. And, you know, my own effort now is to see also university students um, quite a bit to bring that forward. So um, the, the last thing about that was what you had said about these, uh, forming these groups that are also outside of the church. and and just allowing that to flourish so that influence can come back and we can reseed the kind of, you know, if I could call it still institutions that we need or places where, where children and families can come again that will feel more alive and more coherent with the reality that we're in with also nature and everything. And I think that's a real possibility, but meanwhile, all of us have to find a way to hold up our end of what we have to offer to bring this about. So anyway, I just want to thank you. I, I love that you said that because one of the things that uh, my husband, who is a 30 year retired United Methodist pastor and I are doing at our property called Series Acres is intergenerational. We have a young leader retired last year and retired back this year just to, to cross pollinate. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I can't say I'm mentoring him. I have learned as much from him. And so we pulled together a group of 10 people 
with two days notice, because you kind of have to plan the weather that way around here. If you're gonna have a barbecue, sun shining, let's get out and do it. And um, it, the, the intention is to create some kind of a um, summer program where junior and senior in, in high, high school and college are paired with um, homeowners that are doing this regenerative gardening and uh, they spend the summer with a couple of, we've got a couple of really skilled mentor teachers that know about soil science and plants and uh, trying to put a pilot project together uh, and develop this summer and really roll it out next summer because um, the, the other thing is that there's a disconnect with the natural environment, generational. They're, they've been spending way, way more time inside their outdoor play and um, they haven't been exposed to actually planting seeds and playing in the dirt. I can't imagine my childhood if I hadn't planted the dirt. Uh, I, just, I wouldn't be who I am today. <laughs> so yeah, and it is, it is, and in, with the work of the faith community around the environment, um, the urgency is coming from the generation in their 20s and teens right now. That's where the urgency is, and I'm, um, I love that. That gives me hope because they're pushing against my generation who have talked about saving the earth my whole, you know, for 50 years. They've talked about, we've talked about saving the earth and haven't gotten it done. And uh, we need to be, um, we need to catch their urgency. One more thing. So, Skip, you, you talked about belief and how that doesn't seem to be the main question. And I would agree. And particularly in my work with young people, the youth group at St. Paul's, I would say is 75% LGBTQ or non-binary non inquiry, what have you. And the bees that matter to us in that time together are being, so being together, being with, behaving, and behaving in ways that are kind and generous and accepting of one another and belonging. Mm -hmm. And we don't even talk about belief. Yeah, well, Dr. Young's point simply is if um, he, he couldn't accept anything or move forward with anything if it was based on having to believe someone else telling him something. He either accepts it, he, he feels it in his heart, he knows it, or he can't, it's not part of his life. And, you know, it took me 10 years to work through that epiphany, that particular epiphany for me. And, you know, Deb, I wrote a book in 2007 called Tsunami of Blood, which has on its cover the three main Abrahamic religions symbols drawn on a beach, and there's this red tsunami coming upon them. And um, when I wrote that book, I gave it to Deb, and she said, I had no idea that you had so many thoughts about God. And that's because we have never really gone to church together, <coughs> uh, except to you know, placate Deb's mom. But aside from that, we're, we don't go to church anymore because we don't find our spiritual need fulfilled there. I find my spiritual need fit fulfilled here in this confluence that we're doing over the weekend and all the different things that we're doing. There's so many different things. And so anyway, I don't get me started on my soapbox. So, we gotta, we gotta move on. Go ahead. I just wanted to say, you know, Christianity work and I grew up hearing where two or more are gathered, that's where God is. 
And to pick back on what Judith said, the church doesn't take ownership of the anxiety and turmoil that it created in its members through the judgment. And I think, what? how do you join the church? You bat through baptism. You surrender your old life and raise again. And I think the church is at a point. COVID calls that stopping point. And the church is going to have to look at itself and say, we're not there. We, we need to recreate ourselves and we need to look at love and not judgment and move Amen. forward. Yeah. Yeah. It's a sign of a really rich conversation that it's really hard to stop it. Yeah. Yeah. To go. Yeah. So right now we're going to go back to the studio. We've got some food. Um, we're going to do a debriefing of a debriefing lunch of what's going on in the conference. And thank you very much. Anybody that needs a ride, you can Thank you, guys.